The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Are you ready? I'm ready. So basically, <clears throat> I'm going to give you what I consider a prophetic message for this year. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a message that's going to endure beyond this first year, but at the same time, there's, it's a process. And, you know, just like the waters in Ezekiel went from the ankles to the knees to the waist. Okay, the progressive revelation or the progressive unfolding of the plans and the purposes of God are the same way. It's progressive. As a matter of fact, the, the uh, railroad scripture of my entire life was progressive. In the Amplified Bible, Philippians 3.10, whenever Dennis gets a little goofy, I go back to my railroad scriptures. Railroad tracks. Get you on track. You've got them too. Look in your Bibles, the ones you wrote down even when you were a baby Christian. That's there for your instruction, reproof, and correction. If they're that strong that you got them when you were a young Christian, if you start to get a little fuzzy, go back to those and God get you back on track again. But mine was Philippians 3.10 in the Amplified Bible. That I might know Him. That I might become more intimately acquainted with all of the wonders of his personhood. Okay? So that meant that I wanted to walk with him in everything the Bible said he was. I wanted to walk with him in that relationship. If he was the captain of our salvation, I want to know what that felt like. If he was a shepherd, I wanted to walk with him and know what it was like to be shepherded by the great shepherd. I wanted to know what it was like to be a king. And I found out that when I learned Adonai, Jesus is Lord and King, I found out that I didn't, it wasn't a democracy. I didn't have a vote. <laughs> it was like what he said goes. I was to be obedient. Kingship is a little different than what we're accustomed to as far as, you know, you, you don't vote on it. it. The Ten Commandments were not ten suggestions. <laughs> and then you decided whether you wanted to live them or not. All right. But here's the word of the Lord. And... The word of the Lord, as far as I'm concerned, is we're going to move from entertainment to discipleship. Entertainment to discipleship. And I'll tell you why I believe that. Um, and you're going to say, oh, well, you just uh, don't have a lot of uh, entertainment attitude in your heart, Dennis. Well, I'll tell you what. You don't know my history. My first church, and I'm not going to go into detail, my first pastorate, I had pastors come from miles around to copy my bells and whistles. Yeah, that's right. I had all the bells and whistles. I had a room with mirrors that the dancers, four different dance teams, practiced. Hebrew worship dance, ballet, uh, contemporary, whatever they did. I had a sewing room where they sewed, we sewed our own banners and flags. So don't tell me about bells and whistles, but I'll tell you what. I had prophetic teams to where the children had little warfare flags, little short stubby things where they, they liked the sound of the whip. And 30 or 40 of those kids doing that, standing on chairs prophesying to adults. God had basically had pastors come to try to copy the infrastructure, which you, you can't copy somebody's infrastructure. It was basically developing what was there. But what God showed me was that almost everyone in the congregation was actively engaged. I don't care if it was flags, worship, ensembles, four different worship teams, four different dance teams, 60 kids with flags, mime, dance. I mean, it looked like something you'd see at a carnival. All right? And I'm not diminishing that. But what God showed me was all of that was training Dennis to equip the saints. But in that equipping, it was kindergarten. This is, we're talking in the uh, 80s, 1980s. And we were really a forerunner in the prophetic because that was very early for the prophetic. Took a lot of flack for that. I took flack for dancing in church, believe it or not. Um, 
And it was the best years of my life, but it was like I felt like David and Saul was after me. And, and everyone who didn't agree with dancing in the church, flags, whatever, prophecy particularly, uh, they came against. But with all of those bells and whistles, the Spirit of the Lord showed me that what you did, in essence, was equip people for the building. And that there was character result to it, because what they did was they established God confidence, and that made them stronger in the marketplace. But in 1997, God said, no more. There's a shift. And the shift is that you're going to equip all people, skip the bells and whistles, not that they're bad, and you're going to equip them for where they spend 99% of their life in the marketplace. If they can't stand in the marketplace as men and women of God, what good is it? What good is it if they can do it in a building, in a bubble? Come on, some of you that went to Bible school, wasn't it? When you were in Bible school, it was kind of like a bubble. You weren't really out in the real world yet where you had to live your Christianity in front of people. But the bubble has to change to reality. And in studying history... I'm seeing the deterioration of the church from, from, its, from its initial glory to deterioration. It went from discipleship to entertainment. It went to politics, programs. Hmm? It went to people, personalities. And so I want to cover this morning, let's understand how the enemy works in the kingdom of fear but let's understand how God wants to work in the days ahead for, as far as discipleship. How to keep you on track so that you maximize your potential in the coming years. But be aware. We must know the enemy's devices. If you don't know the enemy's devices, you will you'll succumb in one way or another. So let's, let's be aware of the strategy. First of all, here's the word of the Lord. And this is the part that I feel is extremely prophetic. And it will last beyond this one message. God said, Thus says the Spirit of the Lord to Dennis, to the congregation, and to the ministry of which, any ministry of which I have impact in, I am going to recognize that there will always be a struggle. Okay? That's life. Circumstances and people. <laughs> and God's going to teach you to be steadfast in circumstances and patient with people, with joy. Would that require supernatural ability? Would that require an empowering grace? Yeah. Circumstances, steadfast, patient with people, that's all of life. you victorious in those areas with joy. You keep your joy, you're doing something right. Because hmm? in this world you have tribulation, but what Jesus said, but be of good cheer, I've overcome. I've re Another translation says, I've removed its ability to harm you. Once you know that, yes, there's tribulation, but God has removed its ability to damage me because He's given me the tools, the God tools, to bring a life and maturity and discipleship. Now, here's the struggle. This is the key. This will be lasting, uh, I believe, uh, through a period of time, you'll have to continually watch for it to encourage yourself in it. The struggle is 2 Samuel 3.1. This is a prophetic type, a picture. Now, there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But, this is where it gets good, but the house of David grew stronger and the house of Saul grew weaker. Let that, be, let that be your battle cry for this coming year and the years ahead. That the house of Saul grew weaker and the house of David grew stronger. What are we basically saying? We're basically saying, let's personalize this. What do we mean by that? Saul was, the spirit was removed from Saul. So let's say, how about the house of king's self grows weaker and the house of King Jesus grows stronger. Would that be better? Huh? The house of king's self grows weaker and the house of King Jesus grows stronger. That is the word of the Lord. Now we need to know that as a word of the Lord, I want to know, I want to understand the devices that the enemy uses, but I also want to know the solution. I want to know, give me the how-tos. We've been called how-to people from as long as I can remember being a young Christian. And 
wisdom is the principal thing and a spirit of wisdom is what we're requiring. A spirit of wisdom and revelation because uh, wisdom is the application of knowledge. Knowledge is a great thing, but if you don't know how to apply it properly, what good is it? I've seen a lot of wonderfully brilliant people who really didn't know what to do with their brilliance or they did foolishness with their brilliance. Wisdom is the principal thing, application of what God is telling you to do. So I want to know the how-tos. So here's what he's basically saying. It's not just what you believe. You're going to be challenged this year, but it's not just what you believe. It's going to be what you believe versus is he Lord? What you believe versus is he really Lord? Not your Savior. Is he Lord? And Matthew 7, 21 to 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? So you can, you can give lip service to something, but that does not guarantee entrance. You need reality over knowledge, head knowledge. You need experiential knowledge is better than head knowledge. You know that. Now, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God, but he who does the will of my Father. So apparently there's, there's a will of God that is essential and he's not looking for your sacrifices. He's looking for your obedience. Obedience trumps sacrifice. And God says, and let's pay attention to this. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit's saying. Isaiah, uh, Psalm 40, verse 6 says, I've given you, that's you, the people of God, the saints, the holy ones, those that have been separated from God. I've given you a capacity to hear and obey. I don't really want your sacrifice. You know what people do when they don't know what to do? They do something good. But something good is not necessarily God. And some people would rather do the wrong thing than nothing. And God's going to teach us, like the sons of Zadok, how to approach God. And we're going to get into that a little bit. But I, I want to give you basically that the question will be, is Jesus really Lord? And I'm going to go all the way back to the, the early church uh, but understanding that the culture of church entertainment, if there was a deterioration, it deteriorated, oh, we've taught this already, you know, in our, our, our small groups, our accountability groups. It worked in England to turn a nation upside down by the power of God. But in America, house groups really didn't do much because they removed the accountability and they made prayer groups, Bible studies. Did you know you could live in sin and hide and not even build a relationship in a Bible study? I've watched people who had such a deep fear of intimacy in relationship that they would use Bible studies to distance themselves from getting close to anybody and just use talk in conversation, God's looking for relationship over knowledge and lordship over, and doing the will of God and understanding it. So, but here I can see, even in 1 Corinthians, um, I want to read a scripture verse to you. I think that's 1 Corinthians 1, 11 to 13. Jennifer typed my notes, and the, all the numbers are just matched together here a little bit. I don't have little, little colons. So I'm assuming that's chapter 1, verses 11 to 13. All right. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brothers, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now, I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and then there's the arrogant bunch, I am of Christ. <laughs> but there, were, there was still a schism, all right? That'd be the ones that I have the right, I'm the right church, I have the right attitude. But basically what the deterioration was that Paul had to address even in the Corinthian church was, you know, Schisms is like church politics. I'm of this, I'm of that. You're already diminishing the potential for the anointing in your life, doing that. Personality, I'm of Peter, I'm of... 
And, I mean, he even goes on to say, thank God, uh, were you baptized by Paul? You know, if you weren't, what does that mean? You know, it's like the focus gets off of Jesus. And even the ones that said, I am of Christ, had an arrogant spirit about it because they're still in a schism. Paul had to address that. And so even early on, we see that this culture of entertainment and this culture, even in that day, there was a radically shortened training. They would get a lot of information without assimilation. You know, it's real training takes time. And this is where I saw uh, the tremendous amount of deterioration. Uh, besides the accountability groups that were replaced with Bible studies, aren't these good things, Bible studies and prayer groups? Those are good things. But good isn't necessarily God's best, is it? True discipleship requires time and assimilation. So here's what we've learned from a historical point of view that I think fortifies this. If we understand what goes wrong, we stand a better chance of correcting it, right? Well, in the, the early church, the Didache, they basically dealt with changed lives. Changed lives, and it lasted a year. I can answer an altar call and get saved today, and there's not any guarantee of any discipleship afterwards. The early church prospered and flourished because there was a year of assimilation to the truth and an emphasis on relationship, not your theology. Isn't that interesting? Then it moved from the Didache to something <clears throat> that they called the, the Emmaus Road and the Gospel of the Kingdom. There was a strong emphasis. The Emmaus Road, what did Jesus do on the Emmaus Road? He opened unto them the Scriptures and revealed in the Old Testament Jesus to experience and have the Old Testament opened unto you to, under, to see the Jesus in the Old Testament, not just to learn truths, but to learn the manifestation of Jesus in the Old Testament. Think about that. Oh, wouldn't you have liked to walk that road, that road to Emmaus, where Jesus would walk with these disciples and open up the Old Testament scriptures that pointed to Him, to reveal Himself. That's revelation. That's reality. That's Christianity. Then it went and He preached the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is you cannot enter the kingdom unless He's Lord. So the transition that has to take place is not church entertainment and programs, but it's going to be discipleship. And that transition is going to draw, basically, and there will be fear involved as the enemy, because what are you afraid? Well, there'll be churches afraid of losing people if I don't cater to felt needs. There'll be fear of this, fear of that. And quite frankly, I think that the house that's fabricated with self and even too many bells and whistles is going to diminish. And the house of reality with Jesus and Lordship is going to increase. And we need that desperately. I mean, I've seen people where they decided what church to go to based on what their kids said. Give me a break. Who's the adult here? Huh? I mean, I can't, how shallow can you get? You have a capacity to hear and obey. Ask God where you belong. God has appointed the exact time and the exact place in which you should live, where you should work, where you should. There's a jurisdiction there that He's placed for you that He planned beforehand. For heaven's sakes, you know. You have a capacity to hear, and you don't care about your sacrifices. We've got people that lately, I don't know there's been a trend, that are, that are part of us on the Internet, uh, one in particular from Saskatchewan. The nearest church to me is two or plus hours away. You're my church. 
God showed me that. And you know what? They're connected in a, in a significant way that is actually discernible. They start to relate verbally by mail, email, phone, whatever. And you can actually build that relationship because God's not going to leave anybody isolated. Amen. You know, you're very fortunate. You can go just about anywhere in Charlotte and find a church. But there are people that basically have to go hours of driving to find someone that's preaching something that they didn't hear beyond what they heard their first year of salvation. So, you know, nowadays, you know, in my day, I had a zillion guest speakers, most of them prophetic. I got attacked for every speaker I had, I got an attack for, and I loved it. But in hindsight, I didn't see that now God is saying to do that. We don't have guest speakers here for it. I'm not saying you can't. But you know, you can go anywhere on the internet now and get cross-pollination. And you can even get now, to this point, there are reputable people on the internet where you can get confirmation that you're hearing the same thing. And that's healthy. But bells and whistles is not what we need. What we need is, is He truly, in fact, Lord? Because there's going to be a distinction. Because the house of flesh and King Self is going to get weaker. And, but I need this, but you don't understand. I need that. I, don't, I need this. I need. You know what? If you really had your head screwed on properly, you'd be so steeped like a tea bag. You'd be so steeped in God reality that initiative would come from Him and not your good ideas. You'd be so steeped in reality and intimacy that initiative would come from Him. Because like I say, most people rather than sit still, would rather go do something, even if it's the wrong thing, if it looks good. He doesn't want your sacrifices. He wants you to tune that ear to hear what the Spirit says and then obey. Hearing and obeying is what He wants, not sacrifice, not good stuff that has nothing. Now listen, in this deterioration, uh, it went to the early church taught them creeds. All right, like you've heard all the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, there's lots of creeds. They were taught that so that they knew this is what you believe that's sound and this is what you don't believe in. All of the heresies that surfaced, they knew what not to believe as well as what to believe. This was in their discipleship. We don't have that now because now in order to, to satisfy people, you have to have a entertainment Programs, personalities, when in reality we're supposed to be equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry, right? So let me, let me give you an example of the change. Uh, if there is a deterioration, now think about this. One of the greatest deteriorations in the church was the early church, that these people were so vibrant and full of life, also knowing that they may have to give their life for Jesus, I don't see that kind of criteria now if you get saved. Have you entered into the love of God to such a degree that you would die for Him? They knew that, and they were discipled for one year. Later, when the church kind of deteriorated to the degree where it was easy to be a member, and we all know about what Constantine did, right? Oh, everybody, be a Christian. You walk in the door, you join the club. You know, it's like, if you come in the door, you're automatically a, a member. And what happened then was the ones that were hungry and holy and wanted discipleship, wanted to grow in intimacy, wanted more God, did not want the status quo, did not want easy believism, if you want to call it that. You know what they went? They went to monasteries. <laughs> That's how it devolved. As soon as the church's quality deteriorated, the ones that were hungry after God ended up going to monasteries. And then that was a three-year program. So it went from the Didache, where it was a one-year discipleship program, to see that if you really want to live this Christian life, to, okay, it's already now, they're making it easy, anybody can be a Christian, even if it's in name only. And the reality's missing, but it's acceptable now then the monasteries had the real thing, and it was three years. And 
it required three years for a novice to be trained so that the point is it takes time and assimilation to really grow in God. Are you willing to give the time and the assimilation of that reality to grow? You don't grow with knowledge. You grow with obedience to the living word and to the word that God speaks to your heart. Now here, here's one of the ways that the church would change if there's a transition. I say if. <laughs> there will be. But as we move from the easy believism with very little accountability, very little mention of right and wrong, <laughs> what to believe and what not to believe, lots of entertainment to attract, the emphasis will be needs, like I don't have money for my electric bill, I don't have... I don't have groceries enough, I don't have this, I don't have that, to, are those legitimate needs? Yeah, those are felt needs. But the emphasis is going to be on your internal needs. Do you know if we worked on your inside and taught you how to walk in the Lordship of Jesus, instead of begging people for this or that, you know, you just might find out, go get a job. What did Denny Kramer used to tell us prophetically all the time? He said, a young man would follow him around going, Denny, I want your anointing. I want your anointing just like you. I want your anointing. And he'd say, you want, to, you want to increase your anointing? Get a job. Get married. Have kids. In other words, get some personal responsibility and grow up. Needs. The change in leadership emphasis caused the deterioration from easy membership versus discipleship. Needs, call, and purpose. And if you watch the life of Jesus, you know what? He was not trying to make it easy to get crowds, was he? He was not crowd-oriented. Huh? In some cases, they walked away because what he said was hard. All right? The second element of deterioration is not just sacrificing and spending all your time on carnal needs versus internal needs. The second element is feeding them truth, but not training them to walk in it. It's a subtle deterioration because there's nothing wrong with training people in the Bible, right? One person told me they went to, uh, uh, was, it, was it Womack School that you were sharing that? Sharon, he said that if the church really did its job, you wouldn't need Bible schools. That's an interesting concept. But I'd say take it a step further. If the church was really doing its job, it would surpass Bible schools because I've had to minister to a lot of people out of Bible school and they didn't really know that much. So where, where does that put us? I've got some young people that are so well trained um, that basically everything that I hear come out of their mouth, older people would be wise to listen to them. They've been that well trained. Brittany's one of them. She knows she's way beyond her years with their understanding of how to live the Christian life. And I don't care if you went to Bible school. I deal with people from Bible school all the time, and it can be pretty shallow. Because you can skip relationship and learn a lot of information. Hmm? Serve the saints versus equipping the saints. There's a deterioration there. The pastor or the leader of a congregation, and this might appeal to his ego, is the total source of grace. If you need anything, you come to me rather than teaching them to go to Jesus. I don't do personal appointments much anymore. You know why? There's nine books, nine pastors that are fully equipped, and many house group leaders that are fully equipped. If you can't go to your brother or sister who is fully equipped, why would you come to me? My job was to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. That's the Bible. But tradition has locked us into but unless the pastor prays for me, even when we traveled, we would see that. Huh? 
we could have a whole team come up to minister to people, but they'd all gravitate toward the visiting preacher because he's got the anointing for the hour. He's the man of the hour. That's, uh, that's okay, but you know what? If you make a habit of that, you're basically looking to other people to do for you what you could do for yourself if you got closer to Jesus. Equip the saints to do the work. I'm sure there's probably some leaders that are intimidated that if I truly equip these saints to do the work of the ministry, what do I do? Then I won't have a need, they won't need me anymore. If you're that insecure, you shouldn't be in ministry. Now, I don't want to be the source, but I want to impart to yielded disciples. Isn't that interesting in, in uh, Jason's teaching on when to walk away? I thought it was interesting that any time the teaching was too hard and the crowds went away, Jesus poured into the disciples. They, the ones that stayed are disciples. Converts can walk away when it sounds like it might be difficult or might have a requirement. Oh my goodness, I'd have to drive an hour. Huh? We ministered for 12 years, seven days a week, driving two and a half hours was the, the short visit, right? But what we saw in the church was easy believism. Anybody could call themselves a Christian. Very few pressed into the reality of Jesus. If they had to choose, they would take enter entertain me. Let's go to a conference. Let's, see, let's have a guest speaker so that I can get something. There's a value to that, but there's also a weakness built into that. And that is, are you growing in God confidence yourself, or are you looking for someone else's God confidence that you can kind of pull off of? You be the man. You be the woman of God. A lot of leadership says not only are they the source rather than imparting to disciples and causing them to become a resource in the church so that they are a resource even in the world. You know what? I'm going to brag a little bit here and you do with it what you want. But I am so proud that my entire life in ministry, I had people come to the church because they saw changed lives. For 42 years, they saw changed lives and want to know where they went to church. That is a greater testimony than how many converts I got. Because it's the disciples that have changed lives that impact to why someone would even want what you have. Huh? You're going to convince them to have what you have? I mean, if you saw somebody like this, uh, I got the joy of the Lord by faith. I got the joy of the Lord. I just say, keep it. I don't... <laughs> I don't, really, I don't really want your joy of the Lord by faith. It doesn't look, I don't see the fruit. <laughs> you know? I want the evidence of victory. And the house of Saul is getting weaker and the house of David is getting stronger. And so yes, there's a struggle, but I'm telling you, God's got the answer. We've got to learn how to handle this. Look out for the detours. Look out for the maintenance versus maturity. I am the worst pastor in the world from a traditional pastoral point of view for crisis management, for maintenance. I don't do maintenance. I don't do crisis management. I basically will equip you to go to Jesus and get the answer. Uh-oh. He didn't sound very nice to me. We, everything that's ever worked was pointing you to the Jesus in you. <laughs> the Jesus in me is good for me, but the Jesus in you is good for you. Go to Him. Now, we can help in the process of developing the Jesus in you. That's called discipleship. And you're going to get stronger. And the house of flesh is going to get weaker. And the house of God is going to get stronger in you. That's more important. Isn't that what every adult would want for their children? Not to be my child that needs me to be the total source of their income, their strength. That's, that's enabling. And that, you cripple them. You think you're loving them. You are crippling them when you enable and that's a hard message to get across because that's a tough love that people don't consider love. They consider that rejection. Well, that's a bad impression, and it shows that you've got the need to be needed. You want to play God in their life. You are not God, and you are not sufficient to be God. 
The house of Saul needs to grow and diminish in your life so that the house of David can increase. Because that's the, that's the, that's the warfare. That's the struggle. Meeting external needs. Here was the plan. As a baby Christian, when I said, I don't know how to start a church, God told me to plant churches. So I said, I don't know how to start a church. He gave me a plan. He said, teach them their value and personal identity. All right? It was Christ in you, the hope of glory, and every way manageable, they were taught how to rely upon the Jesus in them till they developed a God confidence. Element number two, develop their gifts and talents. Give them space to develop their gifts and talents. And in those early years when the prophetic was very new, most of my people could be what we call third level prophecy. They could prophesy a half an hour. Two thirds of the people out of 250 people, two thirds could prophesy like that. All right? In a time when we were attacked for having prophecy. <laughs> and the children could prophesy. Then, so don't tell me about bells and whistles. I know what bells and whistles are, and they can be good. But at the same time, it was a man was doing a, he was getting his Ph.D. at Emerge Ministries. And it was a counseling type ministry in Ohio. And while he was going, his, his thesis was to investigate 70 leaders, churches, I guess various denominations, 70. And his title was Enabling Versus Equipping. And at the end, he basically said, and I didn't know him from Adam. I met him later. He came to my church and he says, yours was the one and possibly two out of 70 that were equipping versus enabling. That's quite a compliment, but I didn't even know I did it. So instead of being proud, I went, I humbled myself and said, God, what did I do different? Oh, God says, it's just basically your attitude. And I said, what? Like attitude? He goes, yeah, you believe that if Dennis can do it, anybody in the world can do it. He said, keep that attitude. That would diminish you from feeling like you're better than somebody else. But he did show me that the strategy was if you believed other people could do it, you saw the gold in them regardless of how screwed up they were, which never intimidated me. Because I figured, hey, I was screwed up. God used me. I don't care how screwed up you are. God can use you too. You know, it's a big, big God and an itsy bitsy devil like the kids used to sing. It's true. And if you maintain that attitude, you will equip versus enable. Enable is I'm special. I carry the anointing. You, you can't do what I can do, so you need me to do what I need to do. All right? And so... I don't know what that sounds like to you. I'm not, I'm not bragging. I'm trying to make a point that I didn't know what I was doing, that God did it. <laughs> but it was an attitude that if I can do it, you can do it. If I can do it. And too many of you people disqualify yourself. And God says, I'm trying to disciple you in the spirit of God because I've got a plan. I know the plans that I have for you, plans for welfare, not calamity, to give you a future and a hope. But you have to come to me and seek me and when you seek me, you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. you got to die to all of the excuses about how incompetent you are or how you disqualified yourself. Because God qualifies the disqualified. And you have to receive forgiveness for disqualifying yourself. Because God says it's not about equipping you in the building or the church gathering. It's about equipping you for the marketplace. So that you can be mothers and fathers, you can be bosses and employees that actually look like Jesus and act like Him. Now, the enemy or the assault that you need to be aware of, if you're going to draw closer to Jesus and, you're, and it's going to be a reality, we're still covering, before we get to the solution, the enemy. All right? The assault of fear. Now listen to this. Do you think the Apostle Paul was a brave man of God? Mm -hmm. You think he went through a lot, didn't he? But listen to this in Acts. This is worth writing down and studying it because this could apply to you. He was flesh and blood, called of God. 
loved by God. You're called, you're loved, and you're kept by Him. Same as He. Acts 18, 9 to 10. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Whoa! Paul gets a vision in the night. And what did Jesus say to him? This is red letter in your Bible. What did Jesus appear to him in the middle of the night and say? Do not be afraid. But speak. Do not keep silent. For I am with you. And no one will attack to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. Now, I don't know about you, but I think Jesus knows what's going on in an individual's life, don't you think? Don't you think he has some insight into what's going on in your life? So if he appears in the middle of the night by revelation and he speaks this to you, don't tell me for a minute that Paul wasn't afraid. For Jesus to say, do not be afraid. He was thinking about not speaking because I get beat up and stoned and whipped and demeaned in all different manner every time I speak. Have you ever done that? I'm done talking. <laughs> Maybe relationally with somebody. I'm done. That's it. I'm done. It doesn't pay. It doesn't pay. It only gets worse. I believe he was thinking things like this because he was a man, but he was and a man of God. But Jesus wouldn't appear to say this for no reason at all, would he? Speak. Do not keep silent. I know you're thinking about it. I know you're thinking, Paul, that you're done talking, right? You went out of there, don't you? And for I am with you, no one's going to attack you or hurt you. He was already thinking of the consequences. When I speak, they attack. When I, when I speak, I get it. There's people that want to hurt me, and they've done it in the past. I have proof. He says, no one will attack you to hurt you. And I believe he was thinking, I'm alone. You ever got that thought in your head? I'm alone. I don't feel like I fit. I'm alone. He says, I have many people in this city. You're not alone. Isn't that marvelous? I mean, he doesn't appear to say things that do not have a reason. And this reason was, if you're hearing these things, I'm here to tell you otherwise. Yes, there's a struggle, but fear is always the tool of the enemy. And fear may endure, but the house of self is getting weaker. And the house of God is getting stronger. The house of Saul is getting weaker. And the house of David is getting stronger. God's basically saying... That enemy of fear is there. Look at, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we talk about 2020, and there's a couple of scriptures. There's, there's 2 Chronicles 2020, and then there's John 2020. Uh, some have used that already uh, for the coming year. But what's interesting, in John 20, it says that the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. They were frightened. And they are gathered together in a room going, oh no, the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. And when he said that, he showed them his hands and his side and his feet. And he says, then he said, peace to you. And when he said that, he breathed on them and said, receive resurrection life. And now suddenly they're bold. So what happens? Fear tries to contain you and then you need to be reminded that Jesus is in the midst. And when he's in the midst, suddenly he's, oh, okay, things are different now. He might have to appear in a night vision. He might have to appear behind closed doors when you're fear. But fear is always the enemy. But I got news for you. The fear is getting weaker. The struggle's there, but the fear's getting weaker. And the anointing's getting stronger. The house of David's getting stronger. The house of Saul's getting weaker. And that's what you're going to look for for this coming year and the years ahead. You're going to see, actually, Bob Jones prophesied, well, he prophesied actually for the 20s in general. 
but he's, he's talking about something that we wrote a book on. Basically, the, the supernatural power of peace. It's on every page of your Bible, but most people, it's kind of like they know it up here, but they're not walking in it. There is a rest for the people of God that the enemy cannot penetrate the peace of God. When you're at peace, the enemy cannot penetrate the fruit of the Spirit. But God's looking for a people that are going to walk in that new kind of rest. And in that rest, God is going to rest in them. They rest in God. And let the peace of God rule. What does that scripture indicate? Lordship. How do you know if Jesus is Lord and He's not just your Savior? Peace. Now, Second Chronicles, they rose early in the morning, went out to the wilderness. The scripture says, Hear, O Judah, believe the Lord your God and be established. Hear his prophets and you shall prosper. You will prosper, you will succeed. You want to prosper, you want to succeed, obey the voice of God. This is not complicated. So now we get to the solution. We know fear is the enemy, but now we're getting to the solution. We know that God will speak Fear not in any situation that fear is trying to hinder you from being and doing what God called you to be and what God called you to do. So the solution is here. Ezekiel 44, this is a good one to write down. This is a, a, a typical how-to to enter into the solution. Uh, we had our men's group Saturday. There was uh, uh, about 10 or 11 of us. And one of the common themes that was in it was, we want reality and intimacy. We're looking for deeper, richer intimacy with God, getting closer to God. And here it is. Like I said, mine was Philippians 3.10, that I might know, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted. But in Ezekiel 44, it says, the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the rest of the people went astray, <laughs> they shall come. And here it is. You can look at this as a progressive revelation. They shall come near to me to minister to me, and they will stand before me and offer the fat and the blood. In a real simple language, God's basically saying, intimacy, you must come near me first. There is a tendency in the flesh, and it's actually fear-based, even though you're doing something good, to do an action versus going to God. In other words, doing something good versus going to God. But he's saying, come near to me. You need to draw near to me. It needs to be that kind of a relationship. And listen to this, because here's another weakness of the deterioration. If you want to move from entertainment to basically discipleship, then the second thing is minister to God before you minister to people. You'd be surprised how in your activity you will skip ministering to God and minister to people. It's subtle. It's subtle, but it becomes a sacrifice. It can become a dead work. Because God says, where were you? You're working lawlessness. You're, you're doing stuff. Well, did I not prophesy? Did I not cast out devils? Did I not? He says, depart from me. I knew you not. You wouldn't come to me before you ministered to others. You ministered to the people before you ministered to me. That's going to change for 2020 if God's going to disciple you and bring you into a greater strength for the house of Saul is going to get weaker and the house of David is growing stronger. And you want to be part of that cultural of entertainment and shift to the discipleship that's necessary. Now, in Matthew 6, this is the outline that I've used uh, all week and it's brought such life. It's in the message translation and it's a familiar verse of scripture and that is, seek first the kingdom of God and all, all these things will be added unto you. All right, listen to this. This gives an outline or a how-to that to me is a little more succinct. It says, steep your life. What do you think of when you hear that word steep? Kind of like a tea bag. That means don't just drop it in and pull it out. Steep means drop it in 
and absorb and get stronger. Increase. Let there be an exchange of strength. Right? I like it strong, is what God's saying. I like you strong. I don't want weak tea. I don't want you to be God-flavored. I always like that in, in Jude. It says, picked by God and preserved in Jesus. I pictured like jelly. Okay? You were picked by the Father, but you are preserved in Jesus. What does preserved do? It maintains the flavor, the richness. For a long time, that's the way. If it's raspberry preserves, by golly, it still tastes like raspberry years later. Because you were picked by God, but preserved in Jesus. And some of you need to preserve. Some of you need pickled. I don't know, but <laughs> steeped. Okay, let's go back to steep. All right. The message, 1633, steep your life in God reality. If you followed this experientially in your prayer time, you would get results because there's a built-in there's a built-in safeguard here. If you would spend time steeping your life in God, it says steep your life in God reality. God initiative. Oh, if you could hear the wisdom that is in that statement. I am so glad for that message translation. If you make a mistake as a Christian, it'll be you taking initiative. It'll be doing something good but not God. John Bevere had to write a book on that. Good is not God. There's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil and there's a tree of life. When you're flowing from God, you're flowing from the life, the Zoe kind of life, the God kind of life. If you're just doing good, it has an appearance of good. Steeped like a tea bag, soak in the presence of God. Get pickled, preserved, whatever you want to call it, but I'm going to have, I want it strong. So that means I'm going to sp spend a little more time than usual getting strong. And there's an exchange of strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. There's an exchange of strength. It's like my thin little cable in my will is now getting wrapped around with the wires of the Holy Spirit's strength until it becomes stronger and stronger. They that wait upon the Lord that shall renew their strength. They will mount up. They'll run. They won't be weary. Even the young people will fail. But they that wait upon the Lord, shall be strong. God's basically saying, steep yourself in God reality, and then the protective part, God initiative. I don't know about you, but every poor person that I see begging on the road, I don't give money to. There's people that live by good deeds, and um, that's the Christian thing to do. That comes from the intellect. You need to be led by the Spirit not by the intellect. I can still remember the time that I worked with this man who was a financial disaster. And it was really clear to the Lord said, don't give them money, teach them what to do with their money. Because their family's hurting, but the problem that you're throwing money at them isn't going to solve it. They basically said this guy thought that he would have garage sales that would provide for his family. I bought $600 worth of fishing bobbers but I got them at a half a cent a piece. Do you realize if I sent them, yeah, theory, if I sell them for a dime a piece, how much I would make? In the meantime, his family didn't have food. People were providing in that while others were working to equip him to be a man and a provider instead of a handout. And so we wouldn't give him any money. Other people found ways of taking care of the kids kind of sneaky-like, you know. And then he could take a paycheck at work, but he was so bad with his finances that he would put an IOU in and buy payday weekly. He got paid weekly. But by the end of the week, there was no paycheck because he took an advance all week long. Now, I knew what I was dealing with. We are training him he had an internal reality that was far more important than giving him money. Then one day I'm driving in the car with him. This is why you have to be obedient to God and don't figure things out because you're not smart enough. God said, empty your wallet and give it to him. And I did. 
and he burst out crying. It was the first time in a year that he stood at work with the cash register drawer open and decided he was going to trust God and not take an advance. Only God knows that. That's why you got to obey God. Your good ideas are stupid. Really. And you can do more harm enabling somebody with your good than getting a directive from God. Well, you say, well, that sounds too hard. Too bad. God said, my sheep hear my voice. I've given you a capacity to hear and obey. I don't want your sacrifice. Too much of your Christianity is dead sacrifice. Obey God, whether it's easy or whether it's hard, and you'll be better off. Well, how do I know to obey God? How do I? If you would steep yourself in God reality and build that intimate relationship, then God initiative is the byproduct. You skip intimacy with God and you don't have any God initiative. You've got to go by the seat of your pants and do what you think is right. Or wear one of those little bracelets that says, what would Jesus do? That bracelet in and of itself is telling you the state of the church. They're going to try to figure it out. Why don't you go to Him and find out? You're not smart enough. So listen to it. It gets better. Steep yourself. Okay, you tea bags. We're steeping ourselves in God reality. <laughs> now, in that God reality, we're going to be very sensitive to what He wants us to do. So we can have prompt obedience. Because God initiative is a byproduct of steeping in the presence of God. You will hear. When you quiet your noisy flesh and your good ideas... You will hear from God. He doesn't get louder. You get quieter. First thing God taught me in the school of the Spirit was, Dennis, you're a talker. Sit still and shut up. I'm the teacher. What? Anything he would say, I added a whole sermon to it, and the anointing would lift. And I'm going, I think he's trying to tell me to shut up again. So I would shut up, and the anointing would increase. Oh, I get it. Just like school. The teacher does the talking, and the student listens. Ah, oh, how remarkable. He said, Dennis, you don't have anything to say until you've heard something. That's pretty profound. You really don't have anything to say until you've heard something. If it doesn't have life on it, what good is it? Words, words, words. Reminds me of my fair lady, right? Words, words, words. What'd she say to Mr. Higgins? If you love me, show me. <laughs> obey. You love me, obey. Don't just give me words, words, words. People know the right answers. If you've been a Christian a year, you know the right answers. doesn't mean you're living in the answer. Now, Steep yourself in God reality, God initiative, and oh, this is the solution. What happens then? Wherever God initiates, God provides. You steep yourself in God reality, you have God initiative, and whatever He initiates, you're going to prosper. You're going to prosper and succeed. You're going to get established and succeed. Obey the prophets and you will prosper. You will succeed. You will flourish. That is, I know the plans that I have for you, every one of you. Plans for welfare, not calamity. But you've got to seek me and find me. You will come to me and pray to me, and I will answer you. No one, you know, I had somebody in my class one time, I know the plans I have, you plans for welfare. Does that mean that I have to stay on welfare? I'm still on welfare. I've been on welfare for three years. No, that's not what that meant. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but if I am steeping in God reality, God initiative becomes easier to discern what is God's idea and what is mine. And then the provision is there. It will come as confirmation. God guides where He provides. I one time got a email from some I don't know who they were and they wanted to know if the church would give them five or ten thousand uh, dollars because they went on a missions trip that God told them to do and then it, the money never came so would I give it to them no <laughs> I think that's it's a strange to me it was a strange concept 
Somebody must think like that. So, like, somehow I should be compensated for any mistake that I make from somebody else. <laughs> that's like, to me, that's kind of like finding somebody's wallet and saying, oh, God bless me, <laughs> rather than return the wallet. Oh, God bless me with these five. Oh, thank you, Jesus. All right? No. The interesting thing that God has always said in all of these cases of difficulty in your life, if you really had a revelation, if you really believed it in God reality, then when you would hear a statement like, I am with you. Moses said, I can't speak. God said, I am with you. I'll be with your mouth. Every excuse, Samuel, I'm too young. I am with you. God gives the same answer to everybody regardless of their excuse. I am with you. So what we need is a God reality that he is with me and that I am not alone. Hmm? Remember, Elijah, show your servant. Lord, open his eyes. Let him see there's more with us than there is against us. And what did he say to Paul? In a night vision, you are not alone. That's a temptation of the kingdom of fear to get you to think you're alone. I am with you. And if I am with you, you don't need anything else. What would you rather have? $10 and go to Carowinds? Well, nowadays you probably need $50 and go to Carowinds. <laughs> or go with Dad. Uh, to me, it'd be a lot more fun to go with Dad. Unlimited, right? Good old Dad. He'll pay for it all. Well, in the kingdom, we need to have that attitude that He is with us. When I first came here, I left everything with no plan other than obeying God to come to Charlotte. And when I crossed the North Carolina line, I saw a vision of like the old Ponderosa map. You remember the old Ponderosa map where it burst into flame? I saw it burst into flame. And God said, the city in which you've been taken captive, Jeremiah 29, 7, the city in which you've been taken captive, because I was, go here. No plan, no financial plan. The city in which you've been taken captive, pray for its peace, for in it shall be your peace. And you know when I came here without a plan, what I did was I prayed and I found any, anything that had to do with intercession, I involved myself in intercession until God gave me the next step of instruction. The city in which you've been taken, and it's been peace ever since in obedience to God. The city in which you've been taken captive, pray for its peace, for in it shall be your peace. Intercede, get others oriented. Bless them that curse you. Pray for your enemies. Fast for your enemies. You want to see some breakthrough in your life. Now, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you future and a hope. I will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That's not a casual walk in the park. That is going to require some intensity on your part to be steeped in the God reality. Acts 17, 27, so that they would seek the Lord and hope that they might grope for Him and find Him, though He's not far from any of us. So he's, the Lord is near, He's not far, but the groping, what is the groping actually in, in, the, uh, in the Greek has to do with touching. Spirit to spirit touching, spiritual touching, not carnal touching. When you grope after Him to touch, to be aware of spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath, relationship to where you're steeping in the reality of that relationship. They that are joined to the Lord, one spirit with Him. All right? And it says in Proverbs 16.3, a lot of you business people need to hear, anoint your ear to hear this one, because Proverbs 16.3 is a solution. It says, in the Amplified Translation, it says, Roll your works upon the Lord. Roll your works upon the Lord. Everybody likes to have a good work ethic. But God's saying, roll your works upon the Lord, commit and trust them wholly to Him. And He will cause, oh, if you could, this would sink in. He will cause your thoughts to come into alignment with His will. That, you don't have to brainstorm. You don't have to pressure yourself with coming up with new creative ideas. Creative ideas come from the heart of God. All of those years people came to copy my bells and whistles in my first pastorate, I had no idea what I was doing. I only went one baby step of obedience at a time. 
And that's all you have to do. You don't have to have the whole thing planned out. What you need to do is commit to obedience. Roll your works over on the Lord. He will cause your thoughts to go, try this, do this, say okay, say no. <laughs> Are you willing for that level of lordship though? To whether it meets your dream. You know, some of you have to die too for 2020. You've got dreams and visions that were not of God that you concocted because they're an agenda of what you want. Well, I got news for you. Ezekiel 14.4 is going to save some people. If you feel confused, that is an indication it's not God. We, I've heard people over and over again, but God told me, but I'm so confused. You know what that tells me? Run. Reevaluate. But God said, and you're confused. You either didn't obey God or you heard God through an idol in your heart. Ezekiel 14 4 says, Anyone comes to the prophet with an idol in their heart, I, the Lord, will answer according to the idol. What's that? What, what does that mean in simple language? If you have a predilection toward an answer, and you get a prophetic word, you can make that prophetic word fit what you want it to say. Rather than place it before the Lord, wisdom searches out the matter. I can still remember down at Santa Rosa Beach, that person, God, God's going to give you a new marriage. And He meant for you to work on it. But they had an idol in their heart and they had a girlfriend. They went and took that as a word to get divorced and remarry that girlfriend. <laughs> and you'd say, oh, how could you do Oh, if you've got an idol in your heart, you will hear it with a twist. You will get an answer according to the idol that's in your heart. Get rid of the idols in your heart. Roll your works totally upon the Lord. He will cause your thoughts to come in alignment with His will. I mean, you're like guaranteed in advance, aren't you? I know the plans that I have. You plan for wealth. It's like if, if, we, if something happens, we sabotaged our own plan that God guaranteed in advance. That's terrible. Let's not do that. Let's let the house of Saul get weaker and the house of David get stronger. So what are we going to emphasize? In closing... We're going to emphasize in this church, and I believe there will be a departure from the entertainment, and we're going to lean toward discipleship, and that's going to be our encouragement, whether it's popular or not. And we're going to deal with your call and your purpose, as opposed to babying you with your felt needs. And you're crying and you're whining about this owie and that owie. We'll point you to Jesus and say, he takes your pain and your sorrow. Go to him. Don't. No complaining, no looking for everyone else to do for you what God wants you to do for yourself. We're going to teach you to do what the sons of Zadok did. He says, I will cause you, remember, <clears throat> to come near to God, minister to God, and then stand before, I will allow you to stand before me. Stand before me and do what? Stand before him and wait for instruction. Stand before him and don't presumptuously do something. Stand before him and then obey. Draw near to me. Minister to me first before you go asking me for anything. And don't worry about tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow will take care of itself. If you come to me and minister to me, you'll have the God initiative will be automatic. And in that God initiative, I'll show you what to do. Stand before me and get ready to take orders and obey when you hear the word of the Lord. So we're going to be training disciples, equipping the saints, just like that man said. What did you do, Dennis? You equipped the saints. Now, I realize I equipped the saints in my first pastorate for in the building. And an equipper does something different than an enabler. An enabler wants to be the answer for every, all your hurts and owies. An equipper wants you to stand on your own two feet and make something of your life. And they want you to stand and be strong 
just like you would want for your children, to make something of themselves. And equip means you do the ministry. We have people that would like to have an appointment with Jennifer and I, but the test, and I'm saying this there so maybe it'll save some people a problem. If you won't read a book, if you won't listen to a video, if you won't take a minimal instruction, I'm not going to pray with you. Why would I? Because there's disciples and then there's people who just want you to do it for them. 42 years in ministry, here's some of the things I heard, so don't do this. Uh, I would like prayer. I came to your church one time. What are they saying? That I'm obligated? Because you came one time? I didn't know we would have had trumpets. <laughs> Come on, but that's, that's really the kindergarten stage of the church. Don't you think we got to grow up? This is not to sound harsh. It's sound reality. We need a reality check. We need to grow up and disciple. And if we would steep ourselves in God, we wouldn't do that kind of silly stuff. We would basically be equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. And God basically is saying, if we can teach them, then maturity is the emphasis, not ministering to felt needs. Remember the time I got, Pastor, I know a woman in your church. This is somebody outside of the church. I know someone in your church that's having trouble paying their rent. I thought, oh, a concerned Christian outside of the church that knows something about one of the ladies in our church. Well, they should, they're, they're at a house group. The house group should know this stuff. And, and I talked a little further and found out she had vested interest. She was the landlord. <laughs> Oh, so you are concerned about someone in my church who's struggling with their rent, but it just happens that you're the one that gets the rent money. Christian. I'm telling you what, that kind of stuff, God's going to find you out. Huh? How about the person standing on the street asking for money and the person behind them saying, don't give them anything. I asked them, I paid them double minimum wage to cut my grass and they wouldn't do it. <laughs> Sometimes we need that. Huh? God's saying, real experience, maturity, changed lives. And the emphasis on this church from here on in will always be internal realities being met. I want to meet the internal. We have the how-tos. We have the ability. But just like Jesus, if, that's, if you're looking for something else, you have an agenda... Uh, I was looking back there at Glenn. He's been with me for 22 years. He's heard the same message over and over again for 22 years, even when we had three people. Die to your agendas and deal with your issues, and you will prosper in God. Those two things. You know what an agenda is? That's something you want you can't let go of, and it has nothing to do with God. It just sounds good. And you think it'll make you happy if you have it. But you fabricated it. You need to find out if God said it. You want to prosper and succeed? God's got your best interest at heart. And He's not going to make you miserable. Let's break fantasy right now before we close. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, if I have some creative idea of what I think my life should look like, if I have a creative idea, and oh, this is going to mess with some people's courses, if I have an idea of what I think my husband should look like, if I think I have my future husband, if I think I know what my wife should look like, if I, I want to tell you something. You better just die to all of that. The only thing you want is a godly mate. Make a Christian not, I hope that they... I don't care how creative you get. A lot of your creativity is carnal. Selfish. So, Father, we just pray fantasy be broken in the name of Jesus. Any agenda, anything other than true discipleship in Jesus for the years ahead. I want to do what Bob Jones prophesied. I want to be one of those people that entered into that rest. I want to know the peace scriptures come alive experientially in my life. I don't want to just read about them in the Bible. I want to go into the depths of that peace 
to let that perfect peace guard my heart and my mind through Jesus. I want the reality. I want to be steeped in that God reality. I want to flow in the God initiative, knowing that I will succeed and be established in anything God initiates because it'll be God provision. Come on. I want you to memorize that for the coming year. God reality produces God initiative produces God provision. Where He guides, He provides. If He initiates it, you are guaranteed to be a success. We have found the enemy. It's you. And, <laughs> and your fears. But if God says, fear not, and you obey the word of the Lord, and you don't let fear stop you, you will steep yourself in God reality. God initiative will take over, and He will... Because your works are rolled over on Him, He will cause your thoughts to be in agreement with His will. No more brainstorming, just obedience. He doesn't want your sacrifice. He doesn't want you staying up all night figuring stuff out. You're not smart enough. Don't be offended, but you're not. <laughs> so Father, seal this work right now. Destroy all fantasies and all agendas and all issues that would stand in the way I will deal with in the days ahead but I'm going to accomplish the purposes of God for my generation, and I'm going to make ready a people prepared for the coming of the Lord. We need an Elijah prophetic voice that goes forth like a trumpet and says, make ready a way, a way of holiness, that only the righteous are going to walk upon it, and righteous are going to be the saints. The saints are going to be holy. Be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. Cleanse the sinners. Cleanse our hands. Cause us to mount up to the hill of the Lord, to walk with clean hands and a pure heart. Cleanse us, Lord, from all idolatry. Cleanse us from uh, the house of Saul. The you know, king self gets weaker and King Jesus gets stronger in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, there were some things I repeated at least 15 times. If you don't get that, if somebody says, what did he preach today? And you can't remember that, I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.